Here's some help with the Experiment 7 pre-lab. First question says, four of the chemicals in this lab have safety concerns. List each chemical, the problem, and what you should do if the chemical gets on your skin. So, if you look at page 70 of your lab book, there's a table that lists all the chemicals you're going to use in this experiment, and the right column has the safety concerns. So you'd want to look through those, and for each one, list the chemical, list the problem that you would have if it got on your skin, and then list what you should do if it gets on your skin for each one. Um, and so you want to make sure you be very careful with these. Here are some graphic images of the types of burns you can get with the chemicals you're using in this experiment. So this is a burn that somebody got from spilling sodium hydroxide on their hand. This is one people, some, a fellow got from spilling nitric acid on his hand, his finger. This is what happened to a person's eye when hydrochloric acid got squirted into it. This is a person's foot after sulfuric acid was spilled onto it. So you want to make sure you're really careful with those. Really intense, really strong acids and bases uh, don't just exist in the lab. They do exist naturally, even on Earth. And so here is an example, the lake of Kawaijin in Indonesia. This is a lake that exists above, uh, in a crater above a volcano. And the pH of the lake is naturally 0.3. That's where zero is the strongest acid you could have, and 14 is the weakest acid, or the strongest base you could have. This lake is a, a pH of 0 0.3, um, which is stronger than the acids that we're using in the lab. And it's a naturally occurring lake. Not only that, but things live in the lake. And people even uh, approach the lake because the fumes that, bubble, that, uh, that are exhaled off of it Resolidify into sulfur. So sulfur comes out of them and people harvest the sulfur. So some people are not deterred from going close to such a dangerous lake. All right, question two says an extra amount of magnesium is included in the mass you are to use. Explain the purpose of adding extra magnesium. And in the bottom right, you have a picture of magnesium. So if you look at part E, this is where you use the magnesium. And specifically, th at the end of step two, you can see it says, continue to add magnesium a small amount at a time until the formation of copper is complete. And so that hopefully explains, or will help you to explain, why you add the extra magnesium. You want to think in terms of limiting reagents and excess reagents. Try to frame your your response using those two terms. Question three says, HCl aqueous is added to, or hydrochloric acid, is added to the last reaction in part E. What is the purpose of the acid? And so this is part E. There's a slight typo here. If you go to part E, you won't find HCl. Instead, you're going to find H2SO4. So what they really meant to write in this question is H2SO4 aqueous, that's sulfuric acid. So that's what they're talking about when they say HCl. They really mean the H2SO4. What is the purpose of adding that H2SO4? And you can see in the procedure, it tells you what the H2SO4 is meant to do. So hopefully that helps with that. Question four says, a student makes a mistake and adds nitric acid instead of hydrochloric acid in part E. How will this influence his or her result? Okay, so here's part E, and yet again, instead of hydrochloric acid, they really mean that H2SO4, that sulfuric acid, that's in part 3. And they're saying instead of adding that, a student adds nitric acid, which is HNO3. Now, previously in the experiment, H, you, you used HNO3 to react with one of the things that are in the reaction here. So if nitric acid doesn't ring a bell, go previous in the experiment, in the procedure, see what you mixed HNO3 with. See which of these reactants or products in this reaction it would react with, and then answer how it will influence the result based on that. If it reacts with one of the products, it'll lower your products, uh, for example. Question five. 
says 1.63 grams of copper was used by one student to start the lab. After filtration and drying, the student reported 1.27 grams of copper. What is the percent recovery of copper? I have a picture of copper in the bottom right. So they're asking about the percent recovery of copper. Percent recovery is going to be the final mass that you recovered over the initial mass that you started with times 100. So the final mass that you recovered here, they're giving you 1.27 grams. The initial mass that the student started with was 1.63 grams. So we take those, multiply it by 100, and in this case you would get 77.9% recovery.